The Echo Chamber, brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by the international broadcast specialist, Marketeers. The Echo Chamber Creativity Series is brought to you by Ogilvy. Welcome to the Echo Chamber. I'm Arthi Shaw, an editor at the Homes Report and your host for today's episode that focuses on creativity. This episode is part of a creativity series that's brought to you by Ogilvy. So thank you for Ogilvy for sponsoring this episode. So as we all know, at this point, creativity is an all-encompassing term. So I'll be a bit more specific on the focus of today's show. So this is a two-part show, and the first segment features Kathy Baird, who's Managing Director for Content uh, and Social at Ogilvy, and she's going to talk a little bit about how she approaches her work, how she thinks about content and social in today's environment. Um, She actually also runs an improv theater outside of Washington, D.C., and she's going to talk about the ways that practicing improv can actually improve your PR game. Then we'll bring on to the show Bonnie Ullman, and Booth's Chief Insights and Planning Officer, and the firm's chief creative officer, A.G. Bev Alakwa, um, I think I said that right, and they're going to talk about microtribes and the future of marketing, and what will be inter- interesting about that segment is they're going to talk about some original research that they did on the topic of microtribes and, and subcultures. But uh, let's jump in first with Kathy Baird. Well, welcome to the show, Kathy. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So, Kathy, we are here to talk about content, social, digital, that whole mix. Um, and, and of course, you know, Ogilvy has been for a long time on the forefront of that. Um, and I think, you know, in, in general, um, you know, WPP has been really active in that space. And I wanted to start off by asking you to define digital because, you know, that term is thrown around. And even when we're sort of trying to decide who should get digital agency of the year, internally at the Homes Report, we are struggling to really define that against sort of modern, against sort of this modern era where digital touches everything. And it seems sort of, it it seems out of place to almost silo it. But at the same time, there are some specific capabilities that do seem really unique to that space. So I'm curious to get your definition of digital. Sure. I think this is a great question and one that I think is an industry question, um, not just an Ogilvy question. So from my perspective, the way that I see digital is that it is inclusive of everything we do from a technology perspective, be it mobile, social, web, um, some of the more emerging and immersive technologies like VR and AR. I think digital also includes all of the data that we gather from these different touch points with our audiences. And it really is everything in which and which our audiences today are consuming information. So it's a it's a pretty broad umbrella term. From a functional perspective in the um, agency environment, we view digital as mobile, social, and web. So those would be the three things. Um, also, I would say immersive technology as well too is is included in that. Wow. Yeah. Well, so that that covers just about. It very like almost all the aspects of of modern communications mm-hmm. in some ways um so so let me ask you this and how do you separate out social and content because i know in your title you know managing director of content and social those things are separate but um it seems like all content no matter where it originates sort of is integrated into our social into the sort of the social networks um now or at least it should be if it's content that people are engaging with and are wanting to share so how do you separate out content and social yeah i mean i think this is a great question for the topic of this because it really deals with the creativity that is instrumental in activating a a really compelling social case or a social campaign Um, so i think earlier in the days of pr social was encompassing of community management and setting up social conversations and building those relationships and all of that is still incredibly important. But what we've quickly found out is that if we don't have creative storytelling that is activated in our social channels, we're not able to really garner the attention that we need. So I view content as really critical to what makes a compelling or a successful social experience. And that content is oftentimes now the new breed of creativity in an agency space. So what used to be TV spots and advertising campaigns 
are now really being purposed in the social channels, and sometimes these creative activations are solely purposed for socials. They may not ever live in any other format. They may not make it to print or radio or television. They are designed innately and natively for the social channels, and, and that is really the creativity that I think is instrumental in terms of capturing an audience's attention, you know, in social or elsewhere, but specifically why these two functions are connected um, in, in, in the title. So, so then speaking of, of social, um, just sort of looking at what's going on in the news, and I'm curious as to, you know, whether you're seeing any fallout from sort of the Facebook Cambridge Analytical, a- Analytica um, scandal. Like, I mean, do you think there will be sort of an enduring shift in how people are engaging with Facebook? And sh- because of that, should brands be, should they be reconsidering sort of their approach to the platform? Um, well, it's a great question. That's also a great industry question. And I don't think that we're going to see massive shifts from brands in terms of the fallout that's happening. But I do think we are going to be placing greater expectation and regulation on the platforms. It's, it's not dissimilar to, I think, what we saw when websites first started and when e-commerce first started. You know, it was kind of the wild, wild west because we had never been faced with these sorts of challenges before. And innately what happened is regulations started to form around protocol that, you know, brands and retailers needed to follow in order to sell products and services online. And so I think we're reaching that new state now with the Cambridge Analytics situation and some of the data that's being collected. On one hand, I think, you know, I, you know as, as a marketer, it is this data and understanding our audiences which makes it so... Um, so successful in terms of really driving ROI for our brands on these platforms because we know who we're reaching, we know how to reach them, we know what we like, et cetera. And by joining these platforms, we're also allowing them access to our user data. On the other hand, from a privacy perspective, what the platforms need to do is uh, really develop a lot more opportunity to be transparent in what they are collecting on users. You know, myself included, as a marketer, I'm happy to share my information so that I can receive the messages that are most targeted for me and that my time is not wasted by being served other messages. So I view that as a value for me, even being an advertiser. But on the other side, I would want to know specifically in a transparent way what information is being gathered about me and how I can prevent that if needed. And that, I think, is the disconnect, and we're going to see a lot more restriction around that. From a brand perspective, I don't think we're going to see massive move away from these platforms. Our audiences are there. I think there is some fallout from the Facebook situation right now. I do think that by nature of the successes they've had and the market share they've captured, um, that they're not going away anytime soon. Um, you know, other challenges in the industry that we face, you know, we don't see these platforms and these technologies going away, but we see them being held to greater accountability and standards. Yeah, and I and I should clarify. Yeah, that that the questions I'm asking are industry questions. They're not necessarily um, supposed to be specific to Ogilvy. Although I would love to get your point of view on all of these things. Um, okay. And of course, your point of view can be your personal point of view, or it can be the point of view that you know sort of Ogilvy takes um, to some of these things. So um, anyway, I just thought it'd be helpful to to clarify that. Um, Got it. So um, so let's let's talk a little bit about what makes for a good digital. Um, or social or content campaign. Um, and then, you know, so there, this would be a two part question in this, in terms of like, what, what makes for a good campaign? Um, like what are the things that you look for, for all three of those? And I'm assuming there's overlap between those three things since they all sort of feed on each other as we kind of talked about at the beginning of this conversation. And the second part, and this is, this is where I'm really interested in getting your perspective, um, is, what kind of impact should these campaigns be showing? Um, is is awareness still enough, or should these campaigns be following through at some kind of consumer um, end user activation, whether or engagement? Um, so, so yeah, so two part question. You know, what are the elements? What are the ingredients of a good campaign across social, digital, and content? And then on the flip side, on the on the other end of that, how do you evaluate the campaign and what kind of impact? is reasonable for the client to expect from these campaigns. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, So I think what makes a good digital or social activation or content experience uh, is really kind of going back to the roots of 
what advertising and PR really are all about. We need an idea. Uh, we need to make sure that there is, you know, an audience mindset that's understood, an idea or an insight that is developed to meet the audience need, and a creative activation that's happening to garner that audience's attention. Um, so th those, those three things, I think, are pretty critical. The idea, the strategy, and then the creative execution of what that looks like. Um, and I, I usually, in my experience, when I look at work that's being done, um, I, I'm very, of course, we're all wowed by the bright, shiny objects that are flashy and, you know, they capture your attention. But I oftentimes, by training, I look at what is the idea that drove this activation. I did that a lot with some of the Super Bowl activations that were done in terms of what is it that they're actually trying to tell me about this product or what is it they think they know about me that's going to get me to respond. So I think those three things are really, really important. The last thing that I think is really important, and I view this as a marketer and somebody who's working on behalf of brands, are what am I trying to do with this? So what is the call to action? Um, is there a call to action? Is it clear to me based on consuming or spending time with this content that the brand is putting out there, what it is they want from me? Are they generating an opportunity for me to, you know, develop a deeper relationship with them? Are they taking me to a destination where they're expecting me to consume more content? I may or may not be willing to take that opportunity. Are they wanting to offer me something that's exclusive? Um, and I think these things I'm talking about, frankly, aren't new. Um, these have been around since the beginning of time with advertising, but because we have these social channels and we also are competing for um, attention, frankly, we're being served so many messages so quickly um, that it's really important that we have that unique idea that does break through, but also it's really clear what it is they want me to do. I think that also shows that a brand has taken the steps to develop the goal and the objective that they're trying to serve with the activation. So that, that's your, the answer to your first question. In terms of your second question, what kinds of impact are we hoping to have? It really depends. It really depends on what a brand's goals are. And this goes into making sure that, you know, when we work with clients, we're setting goals and objectives and metrics of success in terms of understanding what the needs are. Um, so for a newer product, obviously, there's probably some awareness that would need to happen in terms of motivating an audience to be interested. For another product or brand or service, uh, their goals might be different. It might be that they're, they're working to, you know, they've, they've had attendance. If it's a tourism destination, they've had attendance for years and they've suddenly seen a drop off. So somewhere in that marketing funnel, we need to hit that audience with the content that's going to move them between, you know, the interest and the conversion to a greater extent. Maybe there is no awareness problem, but there's more of a problem with loss of interest or getting somebody to actually make that step toward visiting a destination, for example. Um, but again, it really depends on the business and what the business objectives and needs are and matching the social um, activation to what those goals are. So if, um, so, so then let's go to awareness for a second, right? Cause that's sort of the most basic. So how would, um, you know, if, if, if a brand came to you and, that, and that's what they were looking to achieve on across social media, how would you evaluate that? Would you do it based on engagement with the content, clicks, retweets, comments? Like, how would you ultimately evaluate that? Yeah, I think, I think it's all of the above. I mean, the other thing I think we as, you know, marketers and community, communicators cannot assume is that we're going to get somebody off the social platform to engage further with our brand. And so what I see in that and what the outputs of that are that we're serving them the social experience while keeping them in the platform so that they don't have to leave, so that we're not taking them outside of the platform to another destination. And I think that's become pretty inherent in the way we're, we're developing brands through social channels. Um, in terms of measuring awareness, um, obviously views, video views are part of the equation. Any other kind of engagement like shares, retweets, comments, um, you know, I think those would, those would serve as the awareness metrics that we would be trying to generate. And ideally, you know, we'd be looking at social as one part of a broader campaign. So I think the other thing is, you know, looking at this from an integrated whole in terms of understanding where else is the audience, of, you know, available to be accessed, you know, what are the other touch points that are part of their user journey and understanding how social best, fit, best fits into that need. So... So what 
how much can do you think brands and from when you when you advise them should expect social content you know various let's just stick with social content actually um how much how much how realistic do you think it is when brands say well we want we want to see that it's actually impacting our bottom line we want to see um like like to your point about conversion we want to see a sales lift we want to see more um deal flow um on the back of this so um what's how do you advise clients um when they you know when they do want to make that link between social and and content campaigns and their their business bottom line yeah, this is a great question, and again, it's a huge industry conversation, and I think every brand who we're working with is challenging us to be more specific to, you know, how we're measuring the effectiveness of the of the social input, and, and also this is because social is now a paid strategy. Um, it's unlikely that our content is going to be viewed or visible to anyone unless we're, unless we're promoting it um, with advertising dollars. They're expecting to see tangible outcomes. Um, sometimes these outcomes can be specific. If we're thinking about sales and we have an opportunity to use social as a sales channel, then it's a direct correlation between the spend, how many people see it, and how many people have been converted as a result of seeing that. Um, other brands, our goals are a little bit uh, a less specific. So there might be a brand who's working on reputation. Um, so, therefore, we need to come up with other metrics in terms of understanding this may not be a sales lift, but it's a reputation lift or a brand lift. And a lot of the platforms offer us opportunities to do those brand lift studies behind the scenes in terms of the dollars that we're spending. So, we can show, you know, person A has viewed a piece of content. This is how person A feels about a brand before they view the content. They are then served the content. This is how they feel after seeing the content. And so, we can make some, um, we can make some determinations based on a list study to show whether or not the content has been effective and if it's driving to the ultimate goal. Um, reputation, um, you know, activations oftentimes don't have that tangible sales goal, but they have other goals, which oftentimes are really hard, hard to convey in terms of proving social as a value. Um, a third way I've seen us use, uh, you know, really tie this to a harder metric is determining the value of a connected user. So we can use things like net promoter score to say um, X amount of people who are socially active for brand, you know, brand Y are, you know, five times more likely to recommend this brand to a friend. Um, there's also work that you can do to tie some correlation, whether it's dollars or whether it's, um, you know, more likelihood of social word of mouth um, to that in terms of demonstrating the value. So I would say, you know, it's funny because the topic is creativity. There are creative solutions that we work to find opportunities to tie specific value to spend in social and efforts in social, and it's not cookie cutter. So one of the things that, that you've mentioned at the beginning of this conversation was emerging technologies, and I'd and I'd be really curious to get your point of view on um, where the industry is and where it should be, and what you think the ultimate impact of some of these emerging technologies will be um, on the communication sector. So let's start with artificial intelligence. Sure. Uh, well, I think. Everything we're doing today requires us to think about the audience needs in terms of wanting to be immersed in an experience and also that it's very difficult to connect to our audiences without, um, without capturing their attention because of the, the competitive nature of the environment. Um, I'm finding that, you know, and we, you know, coming from the PR landscape, more and more we are thinking um, of activations that are not your typical PR, <laughs> PR campaign. We're thinking about virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence in terms of, in terms of gaining our audience's attention. Um, I think you know, there have been some campaigns that we've worked on here where we've gotten them into nascent stages of virtual reality. I think some of the more uh, evolved technologies are still yet to come. So I think we're we're, we're moving our way up that way, but I think we'll see more is to come. And I think right now what we're seeing in the PR landscape is a bit nascent. Um, I think by nature of our functioning collapsing a bit more into marketing and into advertising, more and more of those expectations will fall our way. 
So that, that sounded like a, a, a pretty broad um, answer for, 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 you know, that, that would apply to all emerging technologies. I was wondering if you had a specific point of view around AI or even, or even VR. I think, I mean, I think VR and what I've seen so far is fairly nascent um, in the PR function. So we have, you know, I, I won't disclose the name, but we've done one activation where we've used VR to be able to show um, people in the field the experiencing of the experience of managing risk, if you will. And so it's it's really a training by which you would go through in terms of understanding the risk that you face in certain situations. We've used VR technology to be able to communicate that. Um, so that, that's, that's one um, example. I think it's nascent because of the fact that, you know, you're wearing a headset, you're going through each of these exercises by yourself. I think we'll see more to come from more, you know, participatory experience where you're not solitary behind the device of a headset where the technology is a little bit more evolved so that, that the, the experience is more realistic. Um, but I don't think I personally haven't experienced it yet in the PR function. So switching gears um, just a little bit now, um, my understanding is that you um, are, um, you're, you're active on, in the improv space and you and your husband founded the, is it the Unified Scene Theater in Washington, uh, D.C.? Yep. Do you want to tell cool. me a little yeah, bit about this? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to, yeah, all right, do you want to yeah, right, uh, tell me about it? And, and also, like, how does it inform, inform your work as well? Sure. Um, so I started doing improv about six years ago. I signed up for a class on a whim, having had a theater background that I wasn't really able to pursue as much as I wanted because I ended up in corporate America. And so I took an improv class. And I think from the very beginning, what I recognized is that a lot of the skills we learn in improv are very specific to what I need to know in my daily life. Um, things like speaking off the cuff, um, handling a podcast interview, for instance, um, talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, being able to build a strong culture, bringing creativity into my thinking and encouraging others to be as creative as possible. And so um, in my improv journey, I ended up meeting my husband through that. And so we oftentimes would collaborate and talk about different things that we had learned as applicable to being both agency professionals. And about three years ago, we decided that we wanted to open a theater space. And so he now does that full time. Um, it's quite a job. So it's, I do it in my spare time. Um, and we produce shows and teach classes and hold workshops. Um, most of my involvement is on the weekends. I think what I've found as a digital professional is that a lot of these things that we're talking about, you know, web, social, mobile, AI, VR, et cetera, you know, 20 years ago, these things were not here and with us. And so the industry has really exploded. And having been alongside that, I can tell you that every other week, there's something new that I need to know and something that puts us, if you will, out of our comfort zone sometimes, because it might mean that, you know, you've been a, a writer for print your whole life. And now all of a sudden, you know, the world is switched to a digital universe. And now what used to be, especially in journalism, what used to be you know, headlines, you know, headline writing has changed to now thinking about things in smaller character levels so that you can capture attention. Being comfortable in that environment is what digital is all about. It's about change and it's about rapid change. And improv is all about change and rapid change and handling things quickly and getting out of your comfort zone and being willing to take risks and also creating a really positive and creative culture. So, um, so that, that's so interesting. And I mean, so are there any, are there any exercises or are there any, um, I mean, I, I, like, are, are there any act things within improv that you think are really helpful for folks in communications and especially, you know, people that have to be thinking on their feet? Um, I don't know, it'd be, it'd be really interesting if you could maybe walk through like an exercise or something that you, that you, that you and your husband kind of sort of discovered is really applicable for people that are in our, in our space. Sure. Um, yeah, one of my one of my favorites is is kind of silly. It's called Animal Advertising Agency, and a lot of improv is really designed around grouping people together, not giving them a whole lot of direction, and and really having them make up 
creative ideas and bring, you know, just um, just sort of top of mind, you know, what comes out of your mouth opportunities. And so this this game is called Animal Advertising Agency, and we what we do is we seek out an animal and then a household object. So we'll say it's like, you know, the the animal is a panda and the household object is a spatula. And we basically create a scene of a creative agency that has won the um, account that is working to sell spatulas to pandas. And we go around rapid fire in this circle multiple times to get people to contribute to this creative campaign idea. And again, it's very exaggerated and very silly. But what we find is that, you know, and, and there's also this idea of yes and. The two most important words in improv are yes and. And that is basically taking an idea and building on it and accepting. It's, it's adding and accepting versus denying and saying no and shutting down ideas. Um, so with that environment, we have a lot of fun creating this really silly activation for a campaign um, that oftentimes brings about a lot of fun, a lot of laughter, and just this idea that you don't have to censor everything you say. And I think that's something else that I've gotten from improv is, not overthinking what I'm going to contribute to a conversation or discussion and feeling comfortable going with my gut and, and trusting my gut and trusting that other people are going to support me in my role or in my idea or in whatever I'm working on. Um, so that's really, those are the takeaways from, from a really silly, exaggerated um, game. So that made me think of like brainstorming and how, you know, you hear again and again that, you know, you get a bunch of people in a room, in a conference room for brainstorming, and you just have a blank, you know, white sheet of paper on the wall, and, it, and you ask people to come up with ideas, and that can be challenging. So are there any of these sort of games or activities from improv that you bring into work and maybe use, for instance, in a brainstorming session to kind of get, get people to kind of spark some ideas? It's funny because we actually, um, my husband has been here a couple times and done some wor some workshops, you know, with the with the with my team here. And so one of our creatives used a yes and game in terms of a new business pitch that we were involved in about a year ago. Um, and it was this idea where it was like, you know, there was a writing part to it, so sort of a silent brainstorming of rapidly jotting down ideas, and then there was a verbal part where you would give out your ideas kind of on the cuff and off the fly. So. So I've seen it actually put to work here um, in my creative team here. So that, that has been a lot of fun. Um, I also think it's, frankly, it's a mindset. Um, and I think it, improv really just trains you to be inclusive and to think of people, of bringing people in. It's not as much about showing off yourself or making yourself look good. It's about making your team look good. You know, it's about making sure that everybody in your team in improv knows that you have their back. Um, and before I've gone into pitches, I've done a couple of little improv exercises, and at the end, I touch everybody on the back, and we, you know, we kind of pat each other on the back alternatively, and just the words, I got your back, I got your back, I got your back. It's what we say before we go out on stage for an improv show, and how I want my team here to feel when we go in for a pitch or a client meeting that might be difficult. Oh, that's great. I mean, because I, you know, that, that's, I've always wondered, yeah, I mean, like, how, you know, what people do either as a team or individually to really set themselves up, especially for some of these new business presentations, because I know that mm -hmm. can yeah. be can be daunting, even for people at, at all levels, but you know, especially especially for, for folks that are that are more junior. Um, or even like like you said, I mean stepping into a, a client call that you're expecting that will, you know, will be difficult. Um, that, so that's that's great to have some insight there. Um, well, Kathy, this has been a fantastic conversation. I feel like you've shed a lot of great insight around um, some of these you know, emerging technology, social digital, and then also the improv element, which I was actually most excited to ask you about. Because when I saw that in your background, I just, I thought that would be really interesting to sort of parallel or, or tie back to to creativity and, and the industry. Um, I'm going to throw out one open-ended question before we wrap things up. And that's, um, is there anything I haven't asked about that you want to mention? Um, no, you know, the only thing I'll say at the end is just, I, I think sometimes as, as an agency person and, you know, with the demands of our industry, that it's easy to assume that you cannot have a creative life outside of the office. And I do, and I pride myself on it. And to be honest, I think one of the reasons I've been successful at Ogilvy and other agencies is because I'm active in improv. I feel fully expressed creatively, and that just makes me better at what I do and how I relate to people and the creativity that I'm able to bring to my work. And 
I really recognize Ogilvy for championing creativity. It is the most creative agency I've worked for, and I think it has recognized my interest and supported my interest and, you know, been okay with me having this side hustle that I really love. And that, that for me is really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied. You know, it gives me a lot of satisfaction to, to feel rewarded for the creative outlook and lifestyle that I bring to the table here. That, that's an excellent point and, and what a great point to close on because I think increasingly even the data is showing, right, that, I mean, having creative interests outside of work is really important to, to, that, that drives creativity inside work and folks who, 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 just, who, don't, who don't sort of expose themselves to other things or, or have sort of other um, interests, um, I think, really, really limit themselves in that way. So I think that was a really great, great point to, to end things on. Um, well, again, Kathy, thank you for joining us and thanks for your time today. Sure. Thank you so much. Now we'll turn our focus to M. Booth to talk about why microtribes and subculture are the new pop culture. Welcome to the show, A.G. and Bonnie. Thank you. Thanks Happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. So just for our, so our listeners know, um, I am here in San Francisco, and both of you are, are, in from, are calling in from New York. That's right. So... Just to start, and I know, and of course, I know about microtribes um, in a lot of detail. I've seen, of course, um, Bonnie, I've seen you present it several times. But again, most, uh, many of our listeners may not be aware of the research that M. Booth did. I guess, I guess it's what, like 18 months ago now? Yeah, that's about, um, that's about right, 18 months. Yeah, so Bonnie, if you want to give a, just a quick just summary of, of microtribe, the microtribes research and what the findings were, um, and then we can, just to give our listeners sort of a foundation, and then we can jump in with, with more questions. Yeah, happy to. So, you know, we've been watching how consumers, um, you know, were being segmented by marketers and really um, compared that with how they were behaving in real life and online. And it occurred to us, hey, you know, we're not labeling ourselves um, as, you know, a woman who is over 50 or, you know, a guy who's 18 to 34. Um, And so we, we decided to put demographics and psychographics to the side and, and test a hypothesis that people are congregating and coalescing around interests and hobbies and even ideologies. And so we conducted um, what, um, you know, a, a national study, essentially landmark research, and discovered that, you know, 55% of, you know, American adults over the age of 18, you know, self-identify um, as actively following or participating in a community around, you know, a topic or a hobby or a passion. Um, and this was really exciting for us because it opens up a whole new world for marketers to think about consumers and the way that they're describing themselves. You know, if you think about, um, you know, what their bumper sticker on their car might say, you know, I'm a vegan, a tennis lover, or, you know, AG, you've got a, you know, your profile on uh, Insta is fabulous. What, how do you talk about yourself? Absolutely. Bonnie and I, it's AJ, Bonnie and I have like been sort of half joking since the beginning of this this kind of journey into micro tribes and saying that an awesome way to sort of look and identify some of the micro tribes is to look at their Instagram profile or look at their Twitter profile and see how they self identify. So I might be a soul cycler, Negroni lover, new mama, creative at M Booth. And there you see, you know, just in one sentence four of my identities and four of the things that are sort of part of the the, the the makeup of, of who I am and how I identify and ultimately the kind of content ideas um, that will stick with me. So uh, that's, uh, that's an easy place to look and find someone's microtribe if you want to look at it at sort of an individual level. But to Bonnie's point, we also embarked on this research, which really showed us that the members um, of specific tribes are open to having brands talk to them. Yeah, so, and you know, this so, is really important Donna, too. Be- Bonnie, actually, let me look. Um, I, I think I want I just like to clarify something quickly for, for our listeners. Um, so it sounds like there is a distinct difference between being a micro tribe and a subculture. Is that correct? Can you, can you clarify what that difference is? Yeah, sure, I can. The way we think about um, a subculture really is subculture is the kind of micro tribe. But really, the subculture, right, it's a microtribe that exists to sort of a buck, a mainstream idea, right? So the word subculture has been part of our lexicon. It's been part um, of history for quite some time. If you think about, you know, things in the 50s or 60s, like speed mix or 
dead head, these groups really existed kind of in contrast to popular culture. Um, but I think what we're seeing now is that there is a real shift where we see these subcultures, which are a type of micro tribe, um, really kind of blurring with pop culture. So you see your subculture is kind of inspiring what will be next in pop culture. You see um, sometimes your subcultures even being kind of more exciting or a more strategic way to connect with um, to connect with a community of people versus just going for sort of a, a mainstream pop culture idea. One thing that Bonnie and I have sort of observed that we have thought was like a pretty interesting uh, and relevant manifestation of this is thinking about early in 2018, right? We've seen, you know, three landmark pop culture events falling in numbers. So I think the Oscars was down 20%. Um, the Super Bowl was down around 7%, mm -hmm. as was, you know, the Winter Olympics. I think it was one of the lowest performing Olympics of all time. Um, but yet we see the rise in sort of these, you know, more interesting niche sports like curling, for example, where like <laughs> in the past few years you've seen, um, you know, the population of curlers double in the U.S., and you're seeing curling ranks pop up in Tampa and in California. And I think there's, like, a, there are big ones in, like, Dallas now. There's the Curling Club of Dallas. It's, like, super, super it. interesting. The Norwegian curling team, known for their fashion, has, like, a Facebook page of three-quarters of a million people that are just following the pants that they wear. Um, and this is sort of, like, you know, it's interesting to us to look at while these really mainstream mass things, maybe declining in numbers, these more niche sports and communities are really um, having people, to Bonnie's point, coalesce around them with kind of a lot of passion um, and a lot of engagement. And, and that's, I think, where we see a real opportunity for brands to connect with these less mainstream um, groups and really sort of dig into the, the subcultures, which, again, are part of micro tribes, uh, to connect with consumers in a less obvious way and in a way that can be more sticky. Yeah, yeah if, if I could just add one one thing to that, um, you know, is that when we think about subculture, we also don't have to think about it as being super fringe, you know. So Peloton, for example, you know, there are, um, I would venture to say, you know, probably 100 people in our agency who are big soul cycler, right, you know, um, who live for the bike. Um, but you have consumers now who have helped to create this amazing industry around in-home cycling. And, um, you know, that was a, um, really a subculture um, that was started by Peloton, you know. So, you know, you now have been able to push back, you know, on this um, cultural phenomenon, you know, soul cycle, because as a consumer, you wanted to own the experience. You wanted to have it in your house. And so you were stretching the boundaries a little bit. So, you know, that's an example of a subculture that's not necessarily, you know, fringe. So fringe, yeah, that's a great example. And, you know, if you think about it in terms of our definition of subculture and sort of challenging or bugging that mainstream idea, I would argue that Peloton is such an awesome subculture because they're sort of, um, you know, they're sort of, Bucking this idea that you know these so these cycling clubs or the cycling as a sport can only happen in these like elite, super posh, like urban cycling studios. It's like no, actually, you can do this in the comfort of your own home and do it on your own time and connect with people all over the country. So it's sort of you know it's standing in contrast to that mainstream mainstream trend of these kind of you know very cool urban cycling studios. It's saying there's actually another way to do this. So that raises another question then is so, um, you know, if somebody identifies with a micro tribe, it sounds like, I mean, that's certainly, um, it's not, it's not necessarily a permanent affiliation, right? It's, it, it, it'll evolve. And someone who was a soul cyclist, um, two years ago may now be into this sort of home cycling thing. And they may say, have decided that soul cycling wasn't really for them. I mean, and we see this all the time. We see people change their coffee preferences and they might identify really strongly in one, in one place. And then, and then, and then not, or somebody's really in, about being a dog parent, and then they have their own child, and suddenly being a dog parent isn't core to their identity. So then, how do you track sort of the the evolution of of a, of a consumer if you're a brand who's tapping into micro tribes? Yeah, that that's a great question. Um, you know, and so I'll answer that in two parts, if it's okay with you. You know, and and the first is is that there's something that's really magical about the fact that people's interests change. And they may shift in priority, but what we have found is that they typically don't go away. 
So, you know, you're an animal lover, for example, and, and we track, you know, regularly which passions, hobbies, topics, even ideologies rank the highest among consumers in general. Well, animal lovers, pet lovers is typically number one on the list, you know, regardless of, you know, who you've asked. Um, and, you know, so 67% of U.S. households have a pet, so it's not surprising. But you don't stop loving animals. You know, you don't necessarily give away your pet when you have a child. And so, you know, what we learned in our research is that, you know, you've got more than half of people who self-identify as being part of a microtribe are, you know, members or actively engaged participants in five or more tribes, you know, and so particularly as we look at millennials and now Gen Z, you know, this need to be, you know, not only real and authentic, but unique means that we have the opportunity to be part of, you know, half a dozen or more interests and associated subcultures. I love that, Vaughn. And I would also say that a big, you know, a big part of, to your point, RT, like kind of tracking these is also having, um, a real understanding of sort of culture and the different sort of groups that are bubbling up within culture. So I'll give you an example. We might know that a consumer, and they may be like starting out their career, they may be single, we could use some demographic information to understand, but we know that they're like really into food and dining out and they're hardcore foodies. Um, but then to your point, their life stage could change, perhaps they have a child, but to Bonnie's point, that food identity doesn't go away, but it might manifest itself differently. So there's this really cool um, urban dining club called Nibble and Squeak, and it's for I'm a, I'm a member. Yes, Bonnie's just <laughs> laughing at me over here, but um, it's all it's really sort of created for foodies who are new parents. So it actually um, gets you invites and entry into some of the best restaurants in different cities, but you have to eat. There's a catch at five p.m. with other parents with screaming children who are also making a mess. But hey, you could still go to per se, so why not do it? Um, but I think it's sort of understanding, and I think, you know, the online space and living in the digital world, we have tons of data that can also show us, as, like, this foodie migrates through life, what are the different, right, what are the different communities and subcultures and tribes that he or she um, can participate in. So it is that deep passion of foodie, but it just might manifest itself in, in different ways um, as they move through their life stage. So I think it's very important for us to have, like, the cultural context and to also again, use digital to kind of understand what, what their habits are and kind of how they're engaging in these places. I think some of our listeners probably heard you mentioned that, AG, and were like, wait, what's that? Was it Nibble and Squeak? Was that the name of it? Nibble and, yeah, yeah, Nibble and Squeak. The Squeak is for Pip Squeak. Yeah, okay. Um, but, yeah, a very cool dining club popping up in, in urban cities for foodie parents. Mm -hmm. So um, let's let's get some examples. So can we look at a brand um, or can you, can you maybe um, walk us through an example of a brand that has tapped into a microculture um, or micro tribe rather um, really well and, and what maybe lessons we can take away from that, that particular engagement? Because I would imagine there are probably a lot of ways that brands can really mess this up or misstep or not seem authentic. And, and it sounds like there's, this could backfire pretty easily. Yeah, and AG is going to share with you one of um, our our new favorite examples. But you know, you just said something that's really important, and it's about you know backfiring, um, and that typically happens if you haven't taken the time um, to really study, um, you know, the the nature and the cadence of a particular subculture, you know, <clears throat> so. You know, one of the things that we believe in is actively following subcultures and microtribes, both, you know, as, as they do said digitally, but, you know, also in their, their real world existence because, you know, we live these integrated lives. Um, and so, you know, if you are constantly checking in and, you know, we know that these groups love brand support and they're welcoming you into their tribe, then you're going to have um, a much more pleasant and positive experience for your brand, and you're really going to help mitigate, um, you know, any, um, I guess, pushback or, or uh-ohs. Absolutely. One of the examples that Bonnie and I are obsessed with is from, these are, it's not a client, it's the container store, but we're obsessed with this 
brand for many We're reasons. We're also OCG with our closets, but that's okay. Yeah, so that helps our, our love for this brand. But, um, you know, one subculture that we think is super interesting is, you know, sneakerheads. So people all over the world that are collecting, you know, hundreds and thousands of sneakers. And the Container Store did something really cool recently, which we found, which was they actually are featuring real-life sneakerheads. There's one on their website, this woman, Maggie Saul, and they profile her and they show how they, that she's actually using container store like the clear um, drawers to kind of organize and display for like massive um, and enviable I should say sneaker collection and so she sort of like proudly posed in front of that it's also an awesome Instagram backdrop because it like fits on the grid perfectly Um, but you know she talks about how she's actually kind of using their product to sort of organize her sneakers and and display them proudly and and share them um, you know across digital so I think that to me it's like a perfect storm of them being relevant, like inherently kind of having some relevance to a group and then also kind of celebrating their passion, but providing like a utility. Like they actually have a role to play. It's not kind of like a forced connection. They do provide containers that keep sneakers, you know, clean, but also keep them on display and create kind of like easy access for somebody that might be collecting hundreds and thousands and kind of wants to keep their collection top of mind. So that's one we, that's one we really love. And I think another campaign that we admire, um, and we had um, Laura Brinker from CoverGirl with us um, at the Into Summit, uh, where we kind of discussed this topic on a panel, is CoverGirl just launched the new campaign, I Am What I Make Up. And they're a very kind of iconic brand who has used, um, you know, big pop culture icons like Ellen and Sofia Vergara, and they are taking sort of a different approach um, using women with a real kind of like vocational diversity, so women that are into weightlifting and fitness, and they have Aisha Curry, who's like a major like chef and mom and entertainer, um, and they are like showing how makeup can actually help these women kind of create their identity within sort of these passionate groups that they that they are a part of. I think Elon Musk's mother yeah. is also kind of like in the campaign, so kind of getting away from that model of this typical pop culture icon and sort of looking at these different tribes of women, how makeup plays like an organic role in their life, how it helps shape their identity, um, and being kind of more diverse with how they look at sort of role models. It's not just about like kind of an an actress or a star. It's about women with these deep passions and and interests that are, you know, manifesting in the world in like really cool ways. Yeah, and, you know, I I just add to that, you know, CoverGirl is a a great example because it's a brand with a lot of heart and a lot of courage. Um, you know, we, t- we talked about this about 18 months ago, you know, when they announced their first cover boy, and that was James Charles. And, you know, it was just such a, a pivotal moment in time when you had a brand really, you know, sort of in neon light say, yeah, we're going to recognize the subculture and, and, you know, this tribe of guys who like makeup. Um, and so, you know, we're going to invite you into, into our world and, you know, hope you invite us into yours. And so it was just a, a fantastic, um, I think, example of, of a brand doing it right. So and that, there's a, well, um, I, let, me, let, me, let me ask a question now. Um, so a lot of the examples that you listed, uh, other, than, other than the cover boy example, um, are, seem to really lean towards a female demographic. So I'm wondering if you're seeing... How, how, what kind of breakdown you're seeing there? I mean, are, are women more likely to identify with some of these, you know, as you all are, you know, describing them as, as micro tribes? Um, like, what's the gender split there? Yeah, interestingly, the gender split is about 50 50, you know, 51 49. And it, um, you know, varies a couple of points based on um, age. Um, so we're not seeing a big split. You know, we, we know that. Uh, guys and gals may, you know, communicate differently on social. Um, and so that's where you see differences. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because if you look at Peloton, for example, you know, women are going to talk about it online. Guys are going to talk about it online. They, they might say different things, but they're still equally engaged and still part of, you know, forming this entire subculture around a brand. And I think another, uh, when Bonnie and I sort of started with Microsoft, almost two years ago, um, the other brand that we were sort of putting on a micro tribe pedestal was Reebok and CrossFit. I think that they're an awesome example of a brand who sort of identified this kind of emerging subculture, this tribe of people that were really passionate around this activity, which both men and women participate. And they said, you know, obviously instead of 
you know, being for all athletes, we're actually going to really focus on this one group. And, um, you know, from having read case studies and sort of seeing their results from that, they've had positive business impacts. So I think that's one that taps, you know, kind of beyond gender for sure um, into the larger CrossFit community. So, so on, on the gender note, I wanted to touch on something that was brought up actually in, on the Innovation Summit where you all talked a little bit about this research um, in New York in February. Um, so you had um, Elisa Kreisinger who has the podcast, she's with Refinery29 and she has the podcast Strong Opinions Loosely Held, which is fantastic by the way, if any of our listeners oh, are looking, yeah, for, for another podcast to, to add to their, to their stream. Um, and she mentioned that like teenage girls, for example, they tend to be, in some ways, like the earliest adopters for some pop culture movements, um, and yet they they are off, their interests are often marginalized um, when when it's still sort of niche to teenage girls. Um, so I guess two questions here. I mean, that made me wonder: like, are there certain groups that through your micro tribe um, research that you found that brands underestimated, like teenage girls, or underestimated um, in terms of their influence and in, in, in power in pop culture? Um, well, actually, let's let, let's start there, and then I'll follow up with my second question. Sure. Yeah, um, it, you know, it's interesting. I, I'd say first, um, it, you know, if teenage girls were marginalized before, they sure as hell aren't now. Um, so I think we're going to see a big shift, um, you know, coming our way. You know, I do think also that that we as marketers or, you know, as, as brand stewards have often overlooked um, the 50-plus target um you know and and i think we're making a big mistake there you know so the assumption is that you know boomers even the younger end of boomers you know aren't participating or engaging you know digitally or on social the same way that you know gen z or millennials are um and yeah they they behave differently but um they are definitely not a cohort you want to overlook i mean you know they've got the you know as many interests um, as any other consumer, you know, six plus interests that they're actively engaged in and they've got the disposable income to, you know, chase those interests down. One of, um, and Elisa is like one of kind of our favorite voices in, in mind right now in subculture and pop culture. Um, her voice is so refreshing and we so appreciated her time with us on the panel. I think one thing that she, you know, specifically talked about with Teenage Girls and her podcast that everyone should listen to is called The Magic, I think, of Teenage Girls or Why Teenage Girls Are Magic, um, is that often in history women have been, young women specifically, have been big predictors of things like, you know, whether it's Beatles or Hunger Games. Um, and haven't gotten sort of that that credit, have sort of been deemed hysterical fans of things, but they've actually been the earliest adopters of things that ultimately mainstream. Um, and so she brings up a really excellent point. And we also had a conversation, which I think is an important one in this space, around um, we want to celebrate and we want to elevate and we want to co-create with subcultures um, and microtribes. We don't want to steal their IP. We do not want to take their ideas unfairly. Um, and so I think, you know, as we're thinking about how to get this right, you know, Bonnie and I always advocate for if you're going to work with sort of, you know, this community, partner with them and make sure you're crediting them, you're using the right influencers in the community, you're not just kind of co-opting their culture for commercial value, because um, that certainly wouldn't be the right thing to do um, or a way to inspire or excite anybody for a brand. So I think... Um, you know, Elisa brings up a, a great point of even just sort of pop culture lexicon that makes its way out into the world and had talked about the example of On Fleek, right? <laughs> and the woman that, you know, that, that came up with that and how a number of different brands used that phrase, On Fleek, um, but she was actually never credited for that. So they used it in their social media, they, you know, multiple brands. Um, use it in their marketing, but they ne never actually went to the woman who started the term and credited her. So I think there's a real watch out for brands kind of like taking advantage of or stealing ideas um, from these different cultures. And so we definitely, um, from an everyone's perspective, and both Bonnie and I really advocate for, you know, ensuring we're approaching these communities in the right way, building the relationships organically, and really kind of celebrating their passion and giving them that platform. Gee, that's, a, that's, yeah. a, that's actually a really yeah. great point. I'm actually really glad that you that you brought that up. And that is something that's really discussed on Elisa's podcast, which you, re which, which you referenced. So the podcast episode, which again, the podcast is Strong Opinions Will See Held, 
And the episode is called Teenage Girls Are Magic, which um, I will say that I listened to as I waited in line at the DMV today. Um, good, good, and, good. Um, More but, people need to listen to it. Exactly. Okay. No, and I actually, and it, it was so, I mean, I actually sent it to a bunch of other people because I thought um, some of the points she was raising were, were really powerful. Um, so my second question around the, around the, the teenage girls comment was, um, you know, as we, in the context of teenage girls, you know, they, they, they seem to be the earliest of, of adopters for some pop culture movements, but is it true that all, I mean, all of these micro tribes are not necessarily an early adoption group, right? I mean, they're just, they're just a group that is going to really resonate with, you know, if you're looking at it from a brand perspective that may really resonate with that brands, whether it's their product or their vision or their, um, their sort of their approach, or, um, or their mission, so uh, can you sort of um, explain that difference of, you know, how a micro tribe can sometimes be an indicator of an early adopter and sometimes it can't, or sometimes it wouldn't be that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's, let's take the wellness category, um, and, and hopefully this answers your question. So, you know, a few years ago, let's say, you know, 2015, the market size of the global wellness industry was more than 3.7 trillion U.S. dollars, okay? So that's a massive category, right? So, you know, you had various micro-tribes um, or, you know, sectors sort of uh, within this wellness industry. Everything from healthy eating and weight loss, fitness, alternative medicine, and even the spa industry. But what you began to see, you know, from a subculture standpoint, um, what was really interesting is that, you know, consumers began to take uh, and carve out their own space, their own microtribes, their own subcultures. So, you know, forest bathing, you know, which, which I find incredibly fascinating, is this whole counter movement that gets people away from a digital existence, you know, for a little while to reconnecting with nature and, and into this mindful state. Well, so this is something that consumers did, um, and, you know, it's, it's helping breathe a new kind of life into wellness, and it's an opportunity for brands to become part of the wellness space in a whole new way. You know, I think that we're really successful, you know, as marketers, if we keep a finger on the pulse of what's happening from a subculture standpoint, you know, along the forest bathing, you know, sort of avenue that we're going down, you know, plogging. You know, this is a good for you, good for the environment trend, you know, that, that we're hearing a lot about coming out of Sweden, you know, where it, com it combines plucking, like, you know, picking up trash or rubbish and jogging, right? And so, you know, it, it's just so interesting to watch how the, you know, how these microtribe groups and these subcultures take on a life of their own and are driven by consumers. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that um, not every subculture is going to inspire pop culture, but I think some subcultures do ultimately. And you could even like, just a quick example, kind of like in the beauty world is a place where I see this happening a lot. Like even think about like 3D manicures, and these like really crazy like niche nail salons in New York um, in LA that have started creating kind of 3D crystal, really intricate, cool designs. Um, now we're seeing that like play out on the red carpet with celebrities, but the celebrities did start the trend. This trend actually came from some of these very, you know, cool, inventive, creative um, nail salons, and, you know, women, and even some men in some cases, were getting really excited um, in urban areas around their nails, and now, you know, we're seeing the Kardashians file their nails in points and sort of bejewel them in that way. So, you know, from my vantage point, where it felt like trends used to kind of come from always celebrities and sort of this top-down force. To me, I see them bubbling up more now um, from, you know, these different cultures and these different kind of, like, niche groups, and then ultimately they're sort of inspiring. So to me, like, a cool hack is actually looking at what people are doing in, as members of these subcultures, and then, like, I would guarantee that if you watch some specific categories like beauty subcultures, Bonnie's Point Wellness subcultures, uh, food, different subcultures within food, like you'll see that stuff mainstreaming in like 12 months, but you heard it there first. Um, so and I think, you know, on the wellness front too, uh, like Bonnie explained some of the trends that she identified, we'll, we'll start to see mm -hmm. some of that mainstream further. So um, there are a few areas, and I know we have to wrap up in just a moment, but I just wanted to, to recap something. So it seems like there's some key areas where, where micro tribes seem to thrive, and it seems like, you know, parenting status is one, pets, fitness trends, food, 
Uh, are there any other areas where, from a, or at least, I mean, I'm sure there was like more, you know, political and 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 um, and you know, sort of social movement oriented ones as well. But from a in, from a brand perspective, um, what are some of the? Are there any other categories or areas they should be monitoring for micro tribes? Yeah, you bet. Music, music is a big one. Um, entertainment, television, um, and travel. Um, you know, we all want to kind of check out, but you know, thanks to you know organizations and brands like Etsy, you know, crafts and DIY, you know, started a few years ago, and it's here to stay as well. Um, fitness and sports, um, beauty, design, and you know, what we're seeing is a real rise in gaming. Um, you know, we've always had kind of a, a gaming culture, but, you know, we've been surprised in some of the research that we've run lately at the number of what you might consider mainstream consumers who are becoming very engrossed in a, in a gaming subculture. Well, this was, um, I know it, we unfortunately have to have to wrap up, but the, every time, and, and, and AJ, I think, you know, I've seen you speak on this topic now at least once, and, and Bonnie, I've, you and I have talked about this several times, and every time we talk about it, I feel like it's, 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 it's even more interesting and, and relevant, it seems like, to our digital world. Um, well, it was great to have you both on the show today, and um, I'm sure you will be back again to talk about this topic um, at some point again. We look forward to it. Thanks, Artie. All right, thank you. And that concludes another episode of the Echo Chamber and its creativity episode that, again, was brought to you by Ogilvy. Thank you again to Ogilvy for sponsoring this episode, to all of our guests, and to Marketeers for their production help. And we will be back soon with another episode. You've been listening to the Echo Chamber Creativity Series by Ogilvy. Brought to you by The Homes Report and produced by Marketeers.